Okay, in this video, we're going to look at exit design. So for this, we're going to go to volume one, division B, part three, and go to section 3.4. And three, four, six is types of exit facilities. So it's kind of misleading, actually, the types of exit facilities. Um, as discussed in previous videos, really, you know, generally speaking, you're your exit types are going to be either you're going to have horizontal horizontal corridor situation or you're going to have like a vertical um, stair situation probably or you're just going to have a you know an exit straight to the exterior so generally speaking um, or door i should say a door directly to the exterior like on a main floor for example um, but you know, this section here, really a lot of it, um, it applies to, I guess, all those situations, but a lot of this section is specifically kind of uh, pointed at a stair situation or I suppose a ramp situation as well. So going into the first sentence here, 3461, um, slip resistance of ramps and stairs. So this is basically just saying that at the ed leading edge of a of a stair tread, for example, or, or at the edge of a ramp, um, there needs to be... Um, something there that makes it visible basically and slip resistant as well so some examples of that are wooster makes um, these type of things uh, another product that i've used before is uh, masco but you know basically they're just they're just uh, nosings that go on the edge of um, of the stairs so those are, that's a couple of sources you could look at but there's there's lots of manufacturers for things like that and if you have exterior exit stairs and you know over a certain height, then they got to be free of ice and snow accumulation. So usually in that case, you'd end up with a open steel grate uh, tread type situation. Three four six two just sets the uh, minimum number of um, risers of to not more than three, except for maybe a certain case there. You'd have to look at that sentence. Uh, three four six three gets into the maximum vertical rise of stair flights and required landings. And in a nutshell, this is going to tell you that um, you can't go up a stair for more than 3.7 meters without um, hitting a landing, basically. So what that means, so if you had a straight flight of stairs um, and the distance from floor to floor was 3.7 meters, then you could do that. And then if you had a distance that exceeded 3.1 meters, so let's just say you had 3.71 meters for the floor or, or anything beyond that, say four meters is a pretty common um, choice for some commercial buildings, for example, um, then you'd have to add this landing uh, part way up. So basically the height of that landing, you couldn't you couldn't go beyond 3.7 meters um, to hit that landing. So that's what that article is all about. And then, of course, like like always, you got to read things. You know, if you're in a certain group and division here, you need that that maximum is 2.4 meters to 3.7, and so on and so forth. Then uh, 3464 gets into the dimensions of those landings that you got to put in there. Um, so you know, a landing's got to be at least as wide and as long as the width of the stairway in which it occurs. But there are some you know some other um, parameters to that. But generally, generally, sentence one is what usually applies there so the handrail section um, pretty much just has a whole bunch of rules for the handrails on the stairs so whether you have to have one or two and that's based on or more and that's based on the width basically of the stairs uh, they have to be continuously graspable on their entire length they got to be a certain um, size basically there's certain heights that apply to these handrails Handrails need to terminate in a manner that will not obstruct pedestrian travel or create a hazard. Um, so basically, you know, when a handrail gets to the top of a stair, for example, it, it turns into the wall so that you can't run into the end of the handrail, for example. Um, at the top of a ramp or a stair, there has to be a, a 300 millimeter long um, horizontal part section of it. There's a certain space requirement between the handrail and the, the wall surface. And of course, it's got to be designed to withstand some some force, basically. I will point out sentence seven here, except we're interrupted by doorways, at least one handrail shall be continuous throughout the length of a stairway or ramp, including at landings. So usually what that ends up being in most cases um, is, is, you know, in, in a common uh, U-shaped stair, basically what ends up usually happening here is um, the the railing the handrail in the middle which usually is a guardrail as well but 
um, it becomes a continuous one. So, you know, the, the ones on the sides that go to the landings, you wouldn't continue that, that railing typically around the landing like so. Uh, you would, uh, the continuously graspable one is the one in the center because it can just keep wrapping around basically without interruption. So that's generally how you see them built. And then we'll move into guards. And, and really the guards section isn't isn't just talking about guards at stairs. I mean, it's in general, if you have a, if you have a drop in surfaces of um, more than 600 millimeters, then um, you got to provide a, a guardrail basically. And so there's certain heights to guards and all kinds of rules for guards, just like there is for handrails. And then of course, with guards, um, you know, between the pickets, say in a guard, if you had like pickets in the guard, versus a solid glass panel or something like that. Um, there's there's certain um, maximum space requirements um, in that guardrail design, basically. And then there's maximum slopes for ramps here, and the treads and risers are the uh, rise and run of the stairs, basically. So there's a minimum rise and a maximum rise. Oops, right there. And a minimum run for your stairs. Uh, these do vary from part nine residential stuff, so they're they're different. So just be aware of that. Uh, on three four three four six nine, only um, certain types of stairs are required. So you could do um, straight flights, and you can do curved flights, um, or or U-shaped ones, for example. But you can't do the like the winders that you see in residential housing, for example. So you just gotta check through that one. And then 34610 gets into a horizontal corridor type situation, basically. Um, you know, one of interest, maybe if you think back to schools and hospitals and things like that, you'll often find a, a set of uh, doors down corridors, for example, and sometimes they'll swing in in opposite directions. So that would be article number five. That would, would um, require that if the path of exit could be in either direction. Um, going through those doors, so you have to swing a door in the direction of exit. So, so sometimes you see those those doors. Um, they, might, they might be sit beside each other, but at least swing in opposite direction. Basically, it happens occasionally. It's not it's not real real um, common. Um, sometimes you know they both swing in the same direction, and that just means that that's the only direction of exit, emergency exit in that situation. Uh, three, four, six, eleven. Um, at the first sentence, there is talking about um, this situation right here. So you know, there's a certain distance from the um, top or bottom riser to to the door, basically that has to be um, provided. Uh, three, four, six, one, two is direction of door swing. So that one, pretty much in most instances. The door has to swing on a vertical axis, meaning you can't like have a have an overhead door that you roll up or something like that. It has to be a door that swings on a vertical axis, and they have to open in the direction of exit travel usually. So there's, there's some exceptions there, but that's generally how it is. They have to have self-closing devices, so that'd be the door closers, and the reason for that would be because, as discussed in earlier um, videos, the exit is fire rated from the rest of the floor area. So it's a safe zone so that the door needs to close on its own once you go through it to maintain that fire separation. If the door just stayed open, like in a, a door to a bedroom or something like that, if it just stayed open, it'd be kind of pointless in, in keeping um, the hazards of the fire out of the, the safe zone in the exit. So they gotta have self-closing devices, often referred to as door closures. Uh, sliding doors is kind of interesting. So, you know, a lot of say retail spaces and in, uh, institutional and things like that will have the automatic sliding doors that slide open uh, when you when you um, walk up to them and, and a lot of times those main entries are serving as exits as well um, so you know if you read through this it just says they're permitted to be used but you got to go you got to go read this article and, and what that article will tell you is that they still have to swing on a vertical axis so if you go to a you know a common supplier like stanley Durglide is a, a very common slider door type um, if you look closely, you can see it there actually, if you look closely in an emergency push open. So if you actually push on those doors, they will open and swing like a normal um, swing door basically. So they have to have that feature is essentially what it is if, if it's going to be serving as an exit, which it usually is. Um, revolving doors, you don't see this very often, but they're generally not permitted to be used as an exit. Um, you know, so if we read the, through this here, except as printed by sentence three, a revolving door, if you shall be collapsible, 
and this one here have hinged doors providing equivalent exiting capacity located adjacent to it. So you usually see normal hinged doors beside the revolving doors, and, and that's just because in an emergency, um, you know, if someone's pushing on the opposite end of, if you have a crowd of people heading for that revolving door, and they're and there's people pushing on two sides of that revolving door, it doesn't revolve anymore. And then everybody gets trapped in the building. And there was actually, there was a case, I think in the forties or something in the US where um, that actually happened and a lot of people died. So generally anyways, if you see them, um, if you're considering ever using them, just you gotta read through that carefully and, and probably you'll have normal doors um, beside it. Uh, 34616, the door release hardware. So there's a whole bunch of specifics to um, uh, the operation of that door basically. So what this what this section usually ends up with in a exit door is a panic hardware situation. So um, this type of bar you'll notice on doors. And basically, you know, the idea is if you're ever in an emergency, you could just slam into that door and it'll just swing open. Uh, you know, the, the whole point of the article is to make it so that, you know, if it's an emergency exit door, um, you shouldn't have to, um, you know, fumble with keys or any any specific turning of knobs and all kinds of stuff to get out. It's just like, just get out as fast as you can. So generally speaking, when you have an exit door, you would usually see a panic bar um, put on that door, or at least that would be the most, most common instance. Um, you know, if you read through that, there might be some exceptions to that, but that's usually what you find. And I quite like them, so I, you know, I, I'd always specify them anyways, even if, even if this allowed me to maybe not do them because an occupant load was low or whatever, I would still typically do it. And then it looks like this 3, 4, 6, 17 is the exception to this. Um, you know, so for banks and some retail, they obviously don't want people being able to grab stuff and just bolt out of the premise really quickly through those panic hardware doors. So there's there's some um, some articles there that I guess um, have some allowances in there to not do it or modify it in such a way um, that that can be um, deterred basically. And I've never actually read through this in much detail, but but often you'll find. Let's see if there's a picture here of it. Uh, sometimes in retail stores you'll see. Um, a bar that has a, yeah, I don't see one here, but a bar that'll have a sign that says um, alarm will go off. And also there's like a, a 15 second delay or something like that for the door to open. So obviously that's permitted probably in that sentence if we hunted through that through that article, I should say. And then uh, 34618 is quite interesting. Um, so if you do in tall buildings, basically you have to have crossover um, floors. And the whole idea of this is once you're in one of the exits, as you work your way down the building in one of those exits, so see there's two exits. The idea is that if if the one exit you're in all of a sudden becomes contaminated, like maybe there's smoke in it or something like that, you need to be able to get out and switch over to the other exit. So it's not every floor, but um, every every now and then, I guess every two floors or something like that, every two stories, it varies. You got to read through it, but the idea is um, some of those floors have to have. Um, the ability for someone to be able to open that door from the exit side and get back into the corridor or whatever on that floor to run around to the other exit. A pretty crude drawing here, but the idea is if you had like a scissor stair, for example, so this is one exit, um, you know, when you go up, up or down there, and this is a different exit that's stacked um, underneath and on top of the other exit. So they're two separate exits, but basically if you were coming down one of them, heading down, Let's just say at this point you realized, oh, it's it's smoky down there on the bottom floors or whatever. So you got to be able to get in a, out through here, go around over to the other side and get into that exit stair, for example. That's kind of the idea of the um, requirement for crossover floors. And then uh, there's just some requirements for floor numbering. Um, three, four, seven is about fire escapes. Um, Generally speaking, so the fire escapes would be like, you know, the old old school New York um, back fire escapes with the, the steel stairs on the outside and the ladders that drop down and that type of stuff. Um, you know, if you read the first sentence here, they're generally not required. Okay, so they, they shouldn't be put on a building. So they could be grandfathered in um, in renovations and, and, and situations like that. But generally speaking, you don't see them in any new buildings and that's, and that's why right there.
And that sums up exit design. You know, there's a whole bunch of other requirements in there and, and it's very, very detailed, but that's kind of a, a good high level um, overview of what you, what you would find in that, in that section.